My name is Jerry Mikulski. I'll be sort of hosting this uh, next to last session because we still have Michael Jones who will be talking at 2.30. So we have a little under an hour right now ourselves to talk about what just happened. So we don't have, I think half of us are still MIA, probably involved in really interesting conversations. What did you think of the unconferencing? Did that work for you? Was that pretty good? I heard from a couple really enthusiastic people outside. They were happy that we had done this. It, it, there's sort of this problem with unconferencing is that if you've never been to one, it sounds hard to make it compelling to come. And yet, once you've been to one, you're like, of course, I want to go to that part. Like, that's where we're going to get to find out what's really on our minds. Uh, so happy you were there. What we're going to do is debrief a little bit from uh, some of the groups. This is going to be kind of volunteer-wise. We're also going to spend a little time in the next hour going back to yesterday and getting some briefings from the five different breakout sessions we had. And we've got a little bit of PowerPoint and some conversation over what happened there. And I think Carrie Ann Jones is still at an event uh, right now that she'll come back and report in on a little bit, I hope, as well. Um, so it's us sharing what happened. And I'd love to hear from anybody who wants to talk about any of the groups that happened today um, and what was compelling about it. And before I go any further into th those details, um, Gary is going to give us an email address to send whatever notes were taken. So whoever was your rapporteur or your note taker in the, in the meeting, please either scan or type up the notes in an email and send them to an email address still to be, still to be determined. Is Noel in the room? OK, we'll, we'll figure out what this email address is, but that's what will happen to your notes once they're uh, finally uh, written up and collated. So anybody want to talk about it? And we have a couple floor mics, so please get uh, somebody's attention. Do you want to go ahead? There's a mic up behind you, uh, right up forward right here. Thank you. And what was the name of the, the group? Thank you. So our session was e-waste and economic development. Um, e-waste. E-waste and economic development. The, the, we talked a little bit about the entire life cycle of e-waste, but the point of the session was to focus on the issue of how we turn e-waste from a problem in developing economy to an economic opportunity, particularly in the informal um, sector. We covered a lot of substantive stuff, um, and you know, obviously, I can't repeat it all here because the debrief is is uh, going to be short. Um, but some of the things that we talked about are that this is a cross-sectoral issue. It is a, a deep value chain. There are a lot of point things going on, but we need to deal with it holistically when we look at the entire value chain. The people in the room are all passionate and want to continue, so we are going to be connecting with one another. And actually, at the outcome, what we talked about was we'd like to do something at Rio where we look at um, both we think we need to do both top-down and bottom-up. The top-down is some type of a global framework that we can work to rather than locally optimized solutions that are, lo that are globally not, um, discernibly not optimized. And also bottom-up, look at for some real opportunity for some model projects or demo projects that can actually show how this can work and then be replicated and scaled. Mm -hmm. So um, and we're not sure how we go about uh, building something out for Rio, but we think some kind of a, a framework. We did have representation from civil society, government, um, and private industry, and that's what it's going to take to make uh, to make e-waste into an economic opportunity instead of a health I and uh, environmental issue. Would you say your name so people know whom to write to or look for? I'm Catherine Winkler from EMC Corporation. I'm Chief Sustainability Officer. You can find me on emc.com. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. So you guys could all show up there. <laughs> Thank you. You guys could all show up in Rio um, wearing recycled suits or something, like made from made from e-waste, exactly. Well, e-waste would be harder, wouldn't it? It'd have to be like circuit boards. We woven together somehow. Please go ahead. Since we're here, I thought I'd take the mic. This is really uh, David Sauerwein uh, led this session, and it was on results versus input-oriented uh, development. And uh, so the status quo, the idea was how can we actually achieve this? I think everybody can identify with the, the need or the desirability of it. Um, so we started with the status quo, the status quo being that Many interventions really are about a certain amount of money, a certain amount of time, you know, programs then going out with those boundaries. And unfortunately, at the end of that time and money boundary, things tend to just drop off, you know, that nothing happens, nothing is actually sustained for a variety of reasons, um, having to do with the fact that, well, you know, nothing was actually created that, um, that is organic and that has sustainability either from an economic standpoint or from a, um, an impetus standpoint going forward. So 
um, some of the obstacles, although everybody can think just, you know, well, maybe we should just do everything based on results. Some of the obstacles to that are that um, some people raise that some aid actually isn't just about the results. There's some social engineering uh, desire built into that aid project. And so, uh, so maybe they don't really want to just go for the results. Um, some goals actually can't be self-funded, for example. So if you think about results being, being able to be self-funded in the future, that probably can't happen in some cases. And in some cases, you don't have the precursors of, um, of the education of people in terms of actually creating something sustainable, you know, how to actually be entrepreneurial and create something that is sustainable. So if you want to fund for that, you don't really have many people who can, who can uh, achieve it. So the solutions we came up to were three. One is instead of having project-based funding, have it be in a sense an RFP, you know, an RFP with a, a result reward instead of a delivery team going in and delivering a, a program from the outside. The second one was to use somewhat of a venture model. Instead of funding, uh, you know, a large um, multi-stage program funded in stages so that you have actual triggers and milestones. But most importantly, I think our, our third recommendation or approach to this was really about making sure that uh, people in, in all of the agencies involved in funding actually focused on getting money, time, effort related to people on the ground, the people who actually understand um, and are going to be the, uh, the beneficiaries of the change to be able to participate in these kind of more venture-oriented uh, uh, kinds of uh, funding structures. Because what we found in the discussion was that people were saying it's the elites in many of these developing countries who actually have that intellectual capital to do that. And yet, not only will they, in some cases, not actually put the, the, the right kind of effort into it, but in many cases, they really aren't in touch with the actual needs. So if we can do anything which uh, <laughs> out of this conference, uh, for Rio, if we can influence anything, we thought it's important to, uh, to try to get all of the organizations to balance the top down with a lot more bottom up approach. Thank you very much. That's a great report back. <laughs> Anyone else? Next person over here, this side. Right here in front, please. There's a microphone coming over your left side. Hello. Um. So I'm here to uh, to uh, uh, summarize uh, well uh, what a good productive discussion we have on the topic of uh, creating a accountability at a global level, and uh, and basically uh, having using the Rio Plus Twenty as 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 an opportunity to to jumpstart you know a culture of accountability before, during, and, and beyond Rio. Um, just summarizing uh, challenges as we, we had discussions back and forth, very uh, fruitful discussions. Um, so we do want to uh, feature, uh, you know, the governmental, the uh, global, national, top-down commitments. Uh, and uh, this is in the context of, of uh, the, the goal having a, a platform of global commitments on sustainable development. Um, but at the same time, there is an opportunity and the power of uh, including uh, the, the, the bottom-up uh, commitments. And, and there was a whole discussion about you know, how we can make a, a gap analysis between you know, what's committed at a, at a global level and what's actually being done on, on, on the ground level and making that gap visible. Uh, and I could go on and on with this, but uh, uh, next challenge was you know, measuring impacts and, and, and trend analysis uh, with, the, with the data and the type of commitments we can put together on, 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 on the same platform. Uh, and positive feedback loops, uh, so making uh, accountability an iterative process uh, that uses uh, crowdsourcing uh, and uh, the intelligence of social networks that we now have it have, have a, a very, very accessible. Structuring commitments uh, for uh, success. So really, uh, you know, go beyond the commitments, have uh, uh, metrics in how we can uh, measure progress. So these are uh, a set of challenges, and then we had to get more <laughs> pragmatic about this, and so what are we going to do between uh, uh, now in Rio and, and, and beyond? Uh, definitely, uh, uh, there was... Uh, a discussion in about uh, incorporate uh, business leaders and local governments and cities uh, into this uh, set of, of commitments. We, we have to have a multi-stakeholder approach and, and really have the global, the global view of, 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 
of the commitments and, and certainly not reinventing the wheel. There's a lot, uh, a lot out there uh, already uh, from from the business world in terms of uh, progress tracking and uh, best practices on reporting. And we definitely uh, want to uh, get that started or get involved that from from the design phase. We definitely have to get hands on on, on having a preliminary design of you know what will be the attributes of one commitment. Uh, we can have a phase approach and, and start simple, comprehensive but simple, and, and go from there. Uh, and then I have a, a, in this first beta uh, 1.0 version at, at Rio, uh, have a, you know, sort of a, a, a scorecard or visualization tools to actually see progress. Uh, to visualize gaps, really make the, the data more visible so people understand the, the power of, of, of this platform and how, how can we uh, evol evolve from there. And um, so we, we're very excited with this project. Uh, we really uh, are making uh, all we can that this can actually happen uh, at Rio and beyond Rio. So if you want to know more about it, uh, you can uh, contact us, uh, an email address, mdevison at uh, uh, nrdc.com, uh, or, or just following, with, following up with us and after, oh, sorry, dot org, <laughs> uh, and uh, following up with us uh, after the session. Awesome. Well, that's all you did? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We want to do much more. That's fabulous. There's another volunteer to report back. What we're doing right now, for those of you who just came back into the room, is we're reporting back on the unconference sessions, what got learned, what got done. Um, please. Uh, so my, uh, my name is Greg DeLon, I'm with uh, Forefront Creative Solutions uh, Laboratory, and uh, uh, we were in the uh, mini-conference about physical planning strategies and how they can be Im improved and informed by these data platforms and uh, technologies. So a lot of it, this was uh, the, the, the sort of the focus idea was integration, so integration in terms of scale between uh, local, regional, and national, international uh, uh, scale uh, decision makers and governments, and then integration between different sectors, public, private, and academic uh, working together, integration between different fields, uh, and then integration between environmental uh, goals of sustainability, economic goals of sustainability, and sociocultural uh, goals of stability. So how can data and data platforms and new technologies be used to increase that integration and uh, create better physical planning tools? So it's just real quickly, some of the key ideas that came out was um, in the realm of using GIS tools, that, uh, that they're uh, using them to create more flexibility between using the same data sets to switch between uh, different types of boundaries, so between political borders or jurisdictions to things like watersheds or socio-cultural boundaries, uh, with still using the, the, the same overall data sets. Uh, appropriation of technology, particularly in terms of empowerment for people out uh, in areas that uh, are learning basic new technologies to be more part participative in the planning process and in that sense become more empowered at the ground roots, grass roots level. Uh, another key idea was consensus building. Uh, so again, using the technology tools for dissemination of knowledge and particularly for combating misinformation that can, uh, that can happen by chance or also can happen deliberately. Uh, and then finally, uh, sharing of data sets. So between different uh, uh, parts of the government, different sectors of the government or departments, sharing of uh, information and data sets and also techniques. Uh, and then also the different scales of government again. So between a, a, a city or regional or a national level, uh, using uh, sh sharing techniques and data sets. And then also uh, seeing that in the, we, we had a very interesting international group from, uh, there was a person from China, person from uh, uh, Paraguay and a person from the Philippines. Uh, and uh, in the case of the China example, they found that at the city level, city and county level, they were most successful at uh, using these technologies and creating effective tools. So then we talked about technology allowing you to scale up with those success stories or scale down so that uh, you are, again, sharing data and uh, techniques and platforms for how to be successful in all the different scales and all the different uh, departments. Thank you very much. There's, let's take somebody from down here. Um, please wait in front, and then we'll go across the aisle. Hi, Fabiola Adamo with uh, Yahoo. 
So we talk about the mentorship program and how to engage more women in technical environment and how to give them like more uh, career options. Interesting is that we found some common denominator and one of like the model that we discussed, it was like a kind of an hybrid model. I called it after talking to all these people in the room, like the one contact in person rule. So at least you need to meet uh, uh, the mentor and mentee at least one time it's because it creates a kind of a emotional connection and then you can actually go on with kind of a virtual connection. And uh, we can also benefit from having men. They can be mentors in like programs because uh, also there are uh, in different cultures, you may have different approaches. So just the women model may not work. So it's good to have a mixed environment. And also men struggle too with work-life balance. Uh, we also talk about another model that's a cascading model. So how to pass on knowledge and they could be interpreted as like a, a training mechanism that is already in place in some of uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, the last one is surely the structure of mentoring. How is it right now? Usually people think it's like, no, a waste of time, but it's like something informal. Actually, you can have more structure and roles to be effective. And also we talked about tiers of mentoring. So tiers, so maybe you can address the mentoring, uh, depends on the age of the people that you're mentoring. So college level, elementary level, and just like structure that have more focused. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Hi, so uh, my name is David Risher of World Reader, and in our group we talked about the very simple idea, but the very powerful idea of using e-readers, like these little the guys, that are lightweight and work well outside, don't take very much power, as a way to deliver books to children and, and adults in the developing world. And we all agreed as a group that these, these devices have certain very appealing characteristics. They're, again, very lightweight, they're very uh, easy to use, they work well in the sunlight. Their cost is coming down very quickly. At the same, and they also have some non-obvious benefits. In fact, we talked a little bit about how important it is that you can increase the font size, uh, which, is, which is quite important if, you don't, uh, if your, your eyesight isn't very good. But then we also talked about some of the limitations of the product as it is today. It's, a, it's a mostly a one-way product. In other words, it's meant for reading. It's not really meant for writing or for interacting. And there are pros and cons to that. It makes it very easy to use in a classroom but it means that some of the literacy efforts that we talked about, particularly the one that Save the Children is using, um, aren't as well suited for this just yet because they involve writing and, and a fair amount of interaction. Uh, but I think we all agree that technology tends to move forward and part of the, the interesting uh, a bit of what we're trying to do is figure out where the technology is working, where it isn't yet working and how it can be improved over time. We talked quite a bit about how literacy efforts, you know, and how fundamental literacy is of course to to the, the, the wealth of a society and even to the stability of, of the world, um, but that they're never just focused on children. They have to be focused on the community. And we spent some time talking about how important it was to involve teachers, of course, uh, but also parents in the broader community in supporting efforts like this. That we've found in my organization, World Reader, the context is we have 500 kids in Ghana that use these every day and, and 100 children in, in, in Kenya as well. And we find when they take the e-readers home and share them with their parents, the children actually read to their parents. And that is incredibly important as a way to involve the entire community and make sure the community understands it. So we all recognize that this is this can't, when you think about children literacy, it can never just be about the children. Frankly, it has to be about the community. And when you think about technology, it can never be just about the technology. It also has to be, in this case, about the books. And so we spent some time talking about how important it is to have books that are, yes, international books, of course, but also local books and textbooks, uh, books that appeal to a, a wide variety of people. Mm -hmm. And then I think we ended the conversation talking very briefly about all of these digital assets that are being created in the world, books being one, but of course music and video, and how interesting it might be if corporations and, and publishing houses and so forth, who today uh, of course make a lot of money selling those books in the developed world, if we could work together to convince them that in the developing world, where the cost of distribution of digital assets is, is, is zero, and the, and the cannibalization risk is very low as well because the sales are so low in the, digital, in, the, in the developing world. Maybe we can work with them in the same way that we've worked with pharmaceutical companies to get them to sell some of their products at a much reduced rate for the developing world. And so that is what we talked about in wow. our group. You guys are the best note takers in an open unconference that I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Seriously. That's we're, all Cynthia. We're not going to get to cover all the different open spaces, so let's let's cue one up. I, I saw Heather walk into the room a moment ago. Heather Leeson, 
And our group did something a little bit sneaky, so I wanted to, uh, Heather, do you want, I don't see you now. Way back there. Do you want to report in a little bit quickly and then I will show what we created? We decided instead of just talking, we'd do something. Um, so what we did was create a video to talk about how to activate and get involved in Rio. So here we go. Let's see if that works. Hi guys, in June of this year, the UN is going to return to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil to update a very important conference they ran there 20 years ago. This one is called Rio Plus 20. We've met at the conference and build up to Rio 2.0, and we really want the world's youth to lead in June. Post your answers here in any format, be it dance, rap, writing, whatever inspires you, and upload it to the hashtag Rio Plus 20. The theme of the event is the future we want. It's all about sustainability and ethical development. What kind of future do you want? Tell us. Go. Youth contributions are essential to, this, to the U.S.'s and the U.N.'s problems. So please, go here, check out U.S. Rio 20, U.N. Rio 20, hashtag, website, www.uncsd. 2012.org, questions, tweet, thefuturewewant.org, myco.org, sustainus.org. Go there. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that's on YouTube right now. The um, URL for it is in our tweet stream. We will put it up again. It's probably been retweeted recently. For each of them, like subtitles. Yeah, just put it, put it underneath. Sounds great. Sounds great. So anyway, that was really quick to do. Like 15 minutes after our session ended, that was on YouTube. So it was very easy. In the back. Thank you. Emma Rashul Fuangi from Madagascar. And uh, our statement was, um, Sustainable development requires stable government. Stable government requires a free and fair election. So the question was how we can use the technology to get a free and fair election. So we, we are also add some uh, other uh, issue was, uh, to resolve was we need to do this for every election, not just one election, every election. And also, we need to find a mobilization to educate the citizen and all the, the populations and the young people. And also, we would like to uh, ask the, the summit to put an implementing organization and deputy uh, to follow up. So uh, the, suggesting, uh, the suggestions and the, uh, the tools uh, we are going to use and the brainstorm uh, result from the people where um, Maybe we should use a universal code. Universal code is like a standard code, like a template, like a, a standard definition on what is a fair and free election. And then each country will go and adapt it to their own culture and own value. And also, we would like to uh, uh, mobilize the citizen. We want the citizen engagement in formulation of election procedure. And we want to leverage the social media for crowd, uh, crowd resourcing, education, and auditing. An example was given yesterday where people use their mobile phone to take pictures of the local result and uh, compare it with the final result. And also, we want to partner with the international organizations such as the International Monitoring and also the Carter Foundation, um, RNI, NOI, uh, and all the organizations that could help in fostering this movement. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So I think we should switch real quick. Hold on. Uh, we're going to switch and do the breakout sessions from yesterday. We've got five of them, and I think they'll go pretty quickly. A few people prepared some PowerPoints to talk about what happened. Uh, the first one was health. Amy or Jay, did you want to come up? Come on up, and I will see if I can't find. Did you do, send in? Well, here we go. Uh, health breakout. Looks like that, and looks like that. 
Awesome. Um, so Jay is able to be with us today, but thanks to everybody that came to our two sessions for help. I think this might um, work. Awesome. Will that work? Behind the microphone. Stand oh, stand behind this mic, yes. Yes, sir, I will stand behind the microphone. Um, so we went through and tried to identify what the biggest challenges were around health. And as you remember from Eric's amazing talk, he gave us the three C's framework. And so we used that to try to identify what, what our groups thought were the big, big challenges we were facing. And none of these will come as a surprise to, to most folks. Around connectivity, there were things about having lack of access to both the tools and to the information. And then we got into a little bit around some of the metrics and accountability. Um, issues in care force, having people in the right places, either the doctors and nurses being far away from the patients or the patients not able to get to them or to the supplies that they need. And then things around community. Um, one of the most interesting things that we came up with was talking about the Russian doll syndrome around things around health, that healthcare is an issue, but when healthcare is an issue, that sometimes means that water and sanitation is an issue. And if water and sanitation is an issue, that means that poverty is an issue. And if poverty is an issue, that means that corruption is an issue, and on and on. So we got into some roundabout discussions about how health is just related to everything, and it's the beginning or the ending, depending on where you come into the the story. Um, because this was sort of unsatisfying, we also spent a little bit of time talking about some big success stories. And um, a lot of these are things that we've seen happen in, in, in times already, things like telemedicine or point of care diagnostics or having technologies that are powered by solar, things that are available in local communities. But these were things that made us feel optimistic about where we were headed. And hopefully some of the conversations today that had any focus on health are building on some of these um, possible successes so that we can move forward between now and the time in Rio. Thanks. Awesome, thank you very, very much. Our next group was environment, and I understand that Chris Turner can come up and report on that. I will, in the meantime. There you go. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the environment session, we, uh, we tried to do our best to really stir the pot a little bit. Thinking about the, the unconference today, we wanted to make sure that we were maybe uh, encouraging foreplay between ideas as opposed to actual intercourse. Uh, we Was this safe idea sex? <laughs> we, uh, we, we certainly hit on some of the key topics of uh, clean water, clean air, uh, land use, and oceans. Uh, but I wanted to highlight a few of the others that, we, uh, that, that came out of the discussion, maybe with a little bit more of a, of a technology bent to them. Uh, Hollywood. One of, the, one of the suggestions that came out was that the, the awareness battle really has not been won. Uh, and that we needed to somehow harness the power of, of new media uh, and media in general uh, to build awareness. Uh, I'm not sure that reality TV is necessarily the solution to all the world's problems, uh, but in this case, it probably, probably can't hurt. There's always desperate housewives, just to continue the metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, of the other, one of the other ideas that came out was uh, a match.com type uh, means online to help bring together not just small-scale donors and small-scale projects, which has actually been uh, quite successful through a number of groups, but to take that to the next level and try to bring together loan guarantees, loans, funding, uh, large-scale improvements, uh, taking, taking advantage of some of the, the projects that we heard about to map and to really bring the data together to understand what's going on, but now to actually set up a marketplace of sorts uh, to bring those groups together and facilitate those projects. Uh, a little bit of Wall Street. We talked about some of the bad parts of Wall Street. Uh, one of the things we, we, that we do want to address is we want to make sure that there are tools that are developed uh, to help value the natural capital. So how do we bring uh, ecosystems, how do we bring climate change into those economic calculations that are taking place? There's a lot of work that has been done and is being done, but there's a lot more that can be done from a technology perspective to really help companies and all types of organizations address that. Anybody know why I put car batteries on the list? Yeah, it's one of the most recycled products in the entire world. It's almost 100% of the United States and close to that internationally. And car batteries now are basically designed to be recycled. 60% of the lead that, uh, that is used industrially comes from recycled car batteries. 
the, the idea here was that in, in all product design, uh, whether it's e-waste questions or otherwise, is that that cycle begins with the design. The more we design for recycling and reuse, uh, the more effective we can be on the other end of the, of the life cycle. Which sounds like a great overlap with the e-waste uh, group that was in the unconferencing. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's actually where, kind of where the discussion started. Awesome. Uh, the Magic 8 Ball. I know I've seen them all over the world, so I don't know if this is a cultural reference everyone gets, but the, the comment was that we need decision support tools. So it's not just bringing that information together and visualizing, that's really the first step. How do we take, our, how do we take local authorities and really provide decision support tools that can help them, be that simulation, be that predictive analytics or otherwise? How do we start to build that next generation of decision support tools on top of the information resources that are coming together? Uh, Xerox PARC is a reference to, to R&D, so how do we take advantage of the technology to facilitate the research and development and to channel the funds available for, for research and, develop, and development in different environmental topics? Uh, a compass and a map. There's a lot of talk about, about the environmental ethics, so how do we instill, how, how do we instill in people a sense of what, what the environment is, what its value is, and how you as an individual should support it, and how do we take advantage of media and connectivity to reinforce that. We heard a lot about a lot of smaller scale efforts that really are impactful. The question then becomes uh, our last item here, which is Red Bull, uh, which is acceleration, urgency, excitement. How do we, how do we drive that? It was an, an overriding theme in a number of the topics and a number of the discussions. Uh, I'm not advocating for over-caffeinated beverages, but certainly we do need to look for some of those magic sauces that really help accelerate efforts across groups. That Thank was you. it. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. That's fabulous. Thank you. For the agriculture breakout, uh, I think our rapporteur is a student rapporteur, Caroline Mullen. And is there a, a PowerPoint for that? No. There's not. Excellent. Good. And if you use this, this mic, please. Thanks. So I'm not Caroline Mullen. I'm Elise Golan from the Department of Agriculture. Um, in our breakout session, we brainstormed around the types of problems confronting sustainable ag production and consumption. And we, we brainstormed ideas for censoring and forecasting technologies to build precision ag systems in which input use is better targeted to the precise location that they're needed, to the exact amount that's needed, uh, the exact uh, timing when it's needed. We brainstormed around connection technologies for creating markets, for creating input markets, output markets, commodity markets, for creating markets with supply chains that, that track specific product attributes, uh, such as organic fair trade and shade grown. We thought about connection technologies for managing risk and accessing credit, for monitoring community welfare, for strengthening local and regional food supply chains, and for improving the nutritional quality of food. We did all this brainstorming and we came up with two big takeaways to share with you. The first, there's no end to incredible, fantastic technologies out there. I don't know about you guys, but one of the, the most fun things that, that I did during this trip was the speed geeking. I loved listening to about all those technologies and finding out about this world I knew nothing about. So in our brainstorming, we figured out there are, there are millions, well millions, there are many, many technologies that are applicable to the problems confronting sustainable ag production and consumption. Okay, takeaway number two. Despite all those wonderful technologies, most of the same problems that have plagued agriculture for generations continue to plague agriculture today. So what makes these problems intractable? It's not lack of technologies. It's lack of what comes next. It's lack of that sustainable business model. It's lack of good information about the value proposition for farmers and farm communities. It's a lack of a plan to create that spark. Where is that Silicon, Silicon Valley magic? You know, that Stanford Business School charm. That's what we need. We need that extra oomph, that extra, you know, je ne sais quoi that's going to take us the extra mile. And so that's what we took out of our, our ag session. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very, very much. Uh, and now reporting from the Sustainable Economic Growth Group, John Burton. And the long walk across stage. <laughs> Wait, we should, we should at least shake hands really well. <laughs> Okay, great. All right, so we, uh, we took two different approaches for each of our breakout sessions. Uh, for the first session, we basically, we started off brainstorming a lot of the challenges and obstacles to sustainable economic growth. Uh, but then our conversation really veered on uh, a focus on connective technologies and specifically how can we incorporate connective technologies into the experience we're gonna have uh, at Rio in June. Uh, and looking at the questions that we uh, came up with, there were two themes behind it. One theme was the question of how do you build an audience? How do you sort of break through jargon, find the right language, and build this audience? And then the second thing, and you really see it in this third bullet point, is how do you create two-way communication? How do you create uh, feedback that's actionable, that's relevant uh, within a specific window of time? The this slide comes from our second session, and this is the end product. What we did was we took the um, information that came out of the environmental group's first breakout session. So there was like a long list of issues, obstacles, and we put those up on the wall. Uh, every table became its own little group, and we said, with all of these issues in mind, uh, what are the sort of necessary steps? What are the key critical ingredients in uh, policy development, in uh, policy program formation. Uh, it's not too much of a surprise. There was a lot of consistency from, from table to table. And what we've done here is sort of arrange them in a chronological and hopefully a logical order as far as the process of policy formation. Uh, the key takeaway here for, for us is to sort of think about which of these steps is that sort of one-way communication versus two-way communication. So at what point are we sort of putting a lot of information out there versus a collaborative node? And then because we know from our own experiences, policy and programs, they're iterative. There's version 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. So when you're in the process of policy reformation, which node do you go back to when, you're, uh, when you have the opportunity to recreate your policy? So are you sort of stopping at a node where it's one-way communication, or are you taking advantage of an opportunity to maybe go one step further back in policy in order to get the opportunity to initiate some sort of two-way communication? That's it. That was awesome. Thank you. And the very last group is Big Data, and our rapporteur for that is one of the co-hosts of that group, Chris Shipley. Thank you. Well, first, I think we have to thank the, the event for teeing up this topic uh, yesterday for us very well. Uh, because some of the themes that we talked about were, were really um, inspiring for the conversation that happened in the breakout, particularly around issues of scale, openness, transparency, flexibility, and those um, helped us realize that what we were dealing with in our breakout uh, wasn't so much uh, a challenge, but a tool to, to address the challenges. Um, it took us down to two different paths. One was really about the challenge of big data itself and the kinds of things that we might be able to do to address some of those challenges uh, in the use of big data. And the second was about the challenges that could be tackled um, by or through the analysis of and mashing up of, of big data. Um, we came up with a number of different concepts, uh, things that we needed to look at from how to, to um, gather, acquire data more effectively. Uh, we talked about issues around um, uh, standards and formats around uh, analytics, but there are two projects kind of came out of the discussion that I wanted to highlight today. One was really about how do we aggregate all these sources of data? The question that seemed to come up again and again was, so we know the data is out there somewhere, where is it? And so there was this concept of creating a, a kind of catalog, uh, maybe even a kind of Wikipedia of a crowdsourced directory of many of these data sources that are publicly available um, as a project that was, was doable and tackled, that can be, could be tackled in this time frame between now and Rio. 
The second, and this came back to uh, the discussions around transparency and openness, was really how do we create policy for the ethical access and use of data? Um, and uh, I love the, the phrase that came out of this, this work group, which was how do we create sort of a Hippocratic oath uh, a, a, around big data and data access, ensuring that uh, there is uh, access for all, that data remains transparent, and, and above all, that with these large collection sets, we do no harm. Uh, and so developing a, a kind of ethics policy that uh, organizations, uh, the NGOs and governments could sign on to was another, we thought, uh, doable project in this time frame. We then looked at a number of big challenges uh, that we thought might be addressed by the analysis uh, and use of, of big data data sets. Um, and these were, uh, one gentleman was pointing out the, the coming cholera ec epidemic in Haiti and the fact that if in two months we could use data to identify these points of outbreak, that in fact we could, we could um, stem this, this outbreak from, from happening. Um, and he pointed out here, and I thought this was interesting, that there are many of the, the mechanisms for collecting data using S SMS messages and this sort of thing had been done, had been used very successfully, or had been uh, gathered very successfully uh, since the, the earthquake in Haiti, but that what was missing was a response mechanism. And so uh, there's a, a detailed plan, and I hope we'll be posting our notes around how we could create response mechanisms so that the collection of data actually is encouraged. It's not about just sending data into a, a black hole and nothing ever happens, but rather that there are response systems to come back to that. Another problem that we talked about were these issues of, of global landfills, um, and not just the the landfills themselves and the pollution caused there, but the need to recycle, and also the, the, the lives uh, and impacting the lives of people who are making their, their living uh, as trash pickers um, in some of these uh, impoverished areas. And that's a big problem to solve, but one of the, and we recognize that there's a limited amount of time between now and the Rio event, but one, so the target was not to try to solve the whole thing, but at least to let's just first recognize find, identify the locations of these um, illegal landfills using um, various geospatial data um, to, uh, to identify the points of the problem that then allow us to go on to some of the next steps in resolving some of the challenges there. So we had some very exciting discussions. We talked about sustainable fishing and how do you mash up, for example, um, fishing databases out of a place like Monterey's aquarium uh, with Yelp consumer data, data to uh, identify and, and educate about best practices in sustainable fishing, uh, what were the, the the right kinds of fish to be eating in restaurants, things of that sort. Talked about uh, this, these kinds of things in terms of greenhouse gas and, I th and, and the like. And then finally, and I think this is an important one, however we, we frame it for this discussion around big data or for this conference or for Rio as a whole, but is how do we start to really fill the gap between what we've all talked about uh, in these breakouts in these, these, uh, the unconference today, across the sessions yesterday, and what we actually do. Um, there are a lot of, of big goals and big ideas that have been placed on the table, and I think it's incumbent upon us all now to think about how we move from those big ideas to big actions to try to really make some positive change. Thanks. That is actually the, the perfect segue because part of what we want to encourage is actual projects to happen between now and Rio in Rio in June. So we'd like you to band together and if you saw ideas here that you're really interested in and you want to continue, I know that a couple of the breakout sessions uh, and a couple of the unconference sessions collected up names and, are, and intend to keep going, but uh, we would love to be helpful in that process. So we have one more thing uh, before our last speaker, um, but first, uh, let's thank you and thank the rapporteurs and thank everybody who ran the breakouts and the on-conference sessions, please. Thank you for your enthusiastic participation and all the good stuff that came out of the, the groups. So now we have uh, one last reporting from Carrie Ann Jones, who will tell us about a um, luncheon meeting that just took place. And then summarize the meeting. And then, yes. 
I just uh, have to say it's, it's a tough act to follow all of these very succinct, energized presentations. So I just want to add my gratitude to all the energy everybody brought to the meetings. I'm going to do two things. First, I'm going to try to summarize a little bit about the ministerial discussion we had at lunch with many of our colleagues from around the world, and then also talk a little bit about um, the overall meeting, a quick summary, not to the level of detail we just heard, but just paint some kind of big picture items that we think are very important going forward. Um, first, about the ministerial. Um, we had many speakers there, and I'm not going to give any attribution, but just call out what many of the leaders pointed out during that discussion. First of all, it was pointed out that you know, there, are U there are submissions to the UN from different countries on what they think Rio 2012 should be. And there's over 600 submissions, counting countries and NGOs and other organizations. We were told today that there are 1,973 comments in those submissions that touch on the issue of connection technologies and the potential that they offer. So everyone is talking about what the potential is for what we have been discussing over the past few days. Many of the participants called out um, very important observations from their countries, which I'm going to try to summarize. First, many took note of the dramatic advancement of information communication technologies and how it really has driven innovation and helped to, to devise some new tools uh, in development, in governance, in fighting corruption, and in driving accountability. There was certainly the call for that, that, that more can be done, and so we need to sort of pay more attention to that. Participants also gave examples of different policy frameworks that countries have in place, uh, strategic policies for development of research and technology or for environmental policy that they feel help to set the enabling environment. There was also the observation and the, the kind of call to sort of have more data, the importance of data, the importance of open data, the importance of promoting the flow of information in a transparent manner. Participants beyond policy also talked about specific programs and activities that they're doing. And some of them included such, uh, such items as a water information system, which was able to provide a lot of information across the country. Programs where uh, countries and regions were looking at specific environmental technology and trying to verify whether it was appropriate technology or to promote the use of that technology. There was also a lot of discussion about innovation in governments themselves. What could governments do both to enable more innovation, but also to be more, innovation, more innovative in their interaction with innovators and promoting entrepreneurship? Some examples were given where countries actually are trying to have innovative uh, labs or offices within their own government offices to sort of speed this up and to show how it can work. The importance of youth was called out, and the fact that some countries are seeing a large penetration of mobile phones. And many youth have those mobile phones. And so how do we, how do we sort of mobilize that next generation and provide applications and technologies that will be very useful in the process of having them become more active citizens and more involved in what's going on in their countries? The idea, the importance of political will was mentioned that um, I think many of the leaders around the table recognized this. There was a lot of head nodding uh, when the minister was talking about this. And that the political will to sort of make changes, make things happen, uh, stay the course, is something that everyone recognizes, sits with government uh, often, and that it's a responsibility that everyone takes very seriously, but it's something that we constantly have to pay attention to. The digital divide was mentioned that it still does exist. Um, and how do we address it? How do we deal with that in a way that makes sure that there is more access to this ability to be plugged into the connective world that is evolving so quickly? One theme that I'll just wrap up with is, is how do we capture the energy of the individuals, the non-state actors, around specific problems and specific areas? Um, it was mentioned that Rio, the Rio Plus 20 outcome should really capture experiences of a broad uh, collection of stakeholders. And that it needs to be recognized that the private sector is an integral part of that conversation. And how do we uh, keep that energy going and sustain it? 
It was also mentioned that coming from Rio, we really need a big push. Uh, we really need to sort of look at, we all know that changes are needed, and I think it was, it was well stated when someone said, we really need to look at the rate of change. And I think that's something that would be interesting to sort of think about in terms of Rio. And one final point was raised regarding what are our expectations about the UN going into Rio plus 20? in terms of what do we want to see going into it and what do we want to see coming out of it in terms of the role that the UN plays. So that's the summary, uh, a brief summary, um, and I apologize to um, speakers where I may have truncated your comments or not captured everything, but it was an effort to, to, to present to the whole audience here a sense of what we were discussing in our luncheon. So let me move to uh, more of a, a kind of closing remarks and a summary of this uh, this overall conference. First, again, thank you all for being here. I also want to make one thank you. Um, you've heard a lot about the Bureau that I lead, the Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science, but I have to tell you about a very important partner we had at the State Department, and that's the Office of E-Diplomacy, which is an office that really is within the State Department taking this issue of connection technology very seriously and bring it in, bringing it into all of our diplomatic efforts and all of the outreach we do. So I just wanted to call them out because um, the work they do is tremendous and they have been a great partner in getting all of this done and making all the connections we needed in terms of having this conference go forward. But let me get to the, the big messages. I think all of us were struck uh, by Tim O'Reilly's presentation, and one of the things he said is that we really need to stop paying for what we do, for process, and we need to really focus on results. I think that that was, he stated it very simply, he stated it repeatedly, and I think that's a message that many of us can take forward going into Rio. We also heard about just the overall importance of data. It seems in every sector we're talking about the importance of data, the importance of open data, the importance of accurate data, uh, the importance of credible data. And so it's important to have that so that decisions can be informed from a technical and scientific base. It's also important to stimulate innovations. And I think that's something that we really need to focus on as we go forward. It, in addition to just the importance of data, it is a key element in terms of building trust, in terms of transparency and accountability. And we heard again this from different sectors. These are common, I think, issues that we need to take forward from this conference. We also talked about needs for investments in data collection and research. We heard about the need to sustain and increase research investments in agriculture and elsewhere. We learned about how the government what the government role should be. We heard that perhaps government really needs to facilitate and sometimes, as one person put it, just get out of the way. And so I, I take that as a point where the enabling environment is something that governments really need to pay attention to. We have, governments have a facilitative role to play and we need to really think about simplifying processes that will help to enable innovation and advancement in sustainable development. And of course, in Demo Alley, I think one of the messages that was really important was that uh, individuals really make a difference. Individuals can really make a, a big difference in terms of advancing, uh, our, advancing solutions with the problems we have and in also bringing a lot of energy in ways that are creative that we hadn't really considered before. So let me just close by thinking about where do we go from here? So we're in Stanford and we're heading to Rio. So how can we take some lessons learned from this conference and go forward? For the, for the US, we are, we're just thrilled about this conference um, because we think it rep represents the sort, of, the sort of breadth of participation that is really needed at Rio 2012 that many of the players in this room, all of the players in this room, need to be a part of that process. And I think from the breakout groups, you heard, and the breakout groups and the unconference groups, you heard some of these solutions just bubbling up. And I think we need to really tap into that energy in Rio 2012. So there's a question out there that's a, a, a challenging question. 
how do we begin to think about crowdsourcing initiatives as we move towards Rio 2012? You know, we, we see this, we know about it in a lot of different areas, but what's something that we can do that will bring this kind of energy to Rio 2012? The other big message that I took away was the technology is really important. It offers us great opportunity, but we have to know what question we're trying to answer. And I think there were several people who made that point. What are we trying to solve? And I think we need to think about that. And the other piece of that, that observation is, and we need to act. I think we have to think about actions. And I think, again, action is something that we all have come here really ready to act. And I think Rio 2012 will give us a chance to really think about that. So how do we capture that? And we in the US submission have put out there an idea called a, a compendium of commitments that we're going to try to think about in terms of how do we, from a US perspective, capture the energy and the initiatives and take those forward in a way that we recognize all of this energy and we take it forward. Because in Rio 2012, I think we have the opportunity to really re-energize the discussion about sustainable development. And I think everyone in the world is committed to this. I think it's a challenge now for us to recognize the potential of the broader community that you all represent with all of the talent and the spirit and to really channel that into making a difference and taking on the challenges of sustainable development. So with that, um, I'll stop and I again thank you very much for being here and for all of your willingness to experiment with a different kind of conference. Thank you. <laughs>